Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last talk of this year's Global Innovation Forum. My name is Neil McCriner, and I'm the head of design at Canada 4, also known as KD. I'm really excited to share this final session with John S. Couch. Uh, John is the former Vice President of Product Design at Hulu, the US streaming service, and he's also the author of The Art of Creative Rebellion, How to Champion Creativity, Change Culture, and Save Your Soul. Pretty big title. It's okay for me to plug the book, I think, rather than John. Um, <laughs> it's not shameless if I do it. I highly recommend everyone. I'm sure the guys will put it in the chat, this book. It's absolutely fantastic. I've enjoyed it thoroughly, John, for the last couple of weeks. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you join us from a very sunny, with beautiful birds in the background, Arizona. So thank you for bringing some sunshine <laughs> to the conference. Sure. I, I don't actually live here. This is my mother-in-law's house. And you can tell because all the coffee cups and teacups have things like, you know, you're the best. <laughs> and we're like, very inspiring, optimistic, you know, environment. It's a good good mug to bring to the chat. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, John, you and I, uh, our personalities for, could 100% talk about this topic, I think, for hours and hours. So yeah. we are going to have to work super hard to keep this to 30 minutes, sure. but we'll do our best. Um, if we want to kick off, do you want to just give us a really light background, um, uh, intro and background to yourself? Would yeah, you know? I, I think you kind of covered it to an extent. I mean, I have a pretty long CV, but uh, most recently, I was heading up um, the redesign of Hulu, which is, as Neil said, a streaming service in the United States that's currently owned by Disney, owned and operated by Disney. And um, when I started in 2016, it was um, doing well, but not as well as it is now. And it was a really interesting process to completely come in, change culture, redesign the UX and, and uh, deploy. But um, just really quickly going all the way back, my original start in design was probably Wired magazine, so print. And when Wired started in San Francisco, um, it was really revolutionary, you know, in, in terms of graphic design and, and also the content. So I started um, Wired Japan primarily because, well, I didn't start, it was actually there and I helped it, but it was um, primarily because I speak Japanese, you know, like, and it's more like, oh, you, you can, <laughs> that's helpful. So what <laughs> do that and I'm, I'm half Japanese so it kind of was literally in the blood but I I ended up doing that then I ended up doing work with the internet you know hot wired and, and then kind of moved on from there I did a startup and did the usual kind of thing and then when I moved to LA I ended up getting more into the entertainment side so I was VP of interactive at CBS um, and then I was at Qualcomm a lot of different companies until I got to Hulu um, previous to that I also worked at Magento, which is an e-commerce platform, and uh, eBay. Um, right. So anyway, that's that's the hodgepodge of yeah, positive like, history. And um, and out of that, you know, I learned a lot uh, about you know teams, companies, culture. Uh, I learned a lot from really bad bosses and a couple of good bosses, and uh, and that's where I, you know, end up writing the book. Uh, again, not to shill my book, but that was you know part of it was the idea of putting together everything that I've learned uh, in a in a form, you know, that's almost like letters to a young poet, you know, in a sense that this is a, a book that I wish I had had when I was starting out in the business. And so that's how that became to be. And actually that came out of a, a, a speech I gave at South by Southwest um, in 2017, which was um, basically a reaction to the redesign of Hulu where the title, the working title was I Hate Your Effing Design, which was, you know, not saying effing, but it was actually the, the true word, uh, which came from a Reddit post. And um, as soon as we changed it, uh, Hulu, it became, you know, immediately attacked. And so I ended up getting a, uh, giving a speech and I brought on two other people from Instagram and Twitter to talk about the incredibly negative reaction you get whenever you change anything. Right. So, yeah. Everyone has an opinion. Right. And out of that speech, I was asked if I had a book and that's where I decided to write the book. Actually, my wife encouraged me to write the book and I said, OK, I'll do that. You always need an advocate, right? Um, I'm so glad you said that about um, having a book like this at the start of your career, because actually now I've read this, I'm um, going to be that that uh, design leader that tries to get everyone in my team to read it as well. Oh, on there, so. oh thank you. <laughs> um, 
it's worth mentioning it because it will be the backbone of our conversation but we will meander i'm sure um so starting with something in the book that really caught my eye creative courage yeah um i was really interested in this um if you could just touch a little bit more for the audience on you referred to something called the pendulum yeah and it's kind of confidence through mm -hmm. the design the design or creative process and then that isolation you can feel when you have supporters and detractors and right yeah it's, pivotal moment i guess of whether it's going to work or not work yeah it's interesting there's this moment i think whenever you're a creative leader or any, any kind of leader that you almost have to there's almost there's this old samurai saying saying go into battle dead and and the idea is live through the worst case scenario in your mind and so that you're free of that fear when you're doing it and when you're doing a new product launch or you're you're doing something that you're not sure about you're immediately assaulted by imposter syndrome to some extent like can i do this and you're you're fronting that yes of course we can do this to your team but you have to then also convince yourself and part of the pendulum i was speaking of is that there's a point when you are starting the swing of this new project where you have detractors and you have people who do not want change and it's almost like a, a the visual is a bunch of crabs you know grabbing onto you as you're trying to launch this thing and you're going around doing you know deck after deck pre presenting the idea and then you get to a point midway through the pendulum swing where you're completely on your own and you're not sure if this is you know lunacy what you're doing you know or is this something that's truly you should be doing and this is where it cracks a lot of people <laughs> because it's terrifying you know and most people don't want to go to that point um, and, and, but what happens is that once you get past that midpoint of being in the flat field of completely being <laughs> left alone and it starts to work, then suddenly all those detractors come swinging the other direction and the project and off and often you are not even credited with the work that you've done. But you know, this, this is not unusual in any kind of business. It's also, uh, you know, if you ever, uh, watched, uh, the documentary on, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's making of apocalypse now, the movie. Uh, it was completely insane. His wife actually made a documentary about the making of it, and and just to you know meander as usual. But Francis Ford Coppola had made a lot of money off The Godfather One and Two. Yeah, I believe that time, Passion Project was doing Apocalypse Now, which is based on Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, and set in Vietnam. And it went completely sideways in terms of the budget and what was the shooting that was going on and. He had to mortgage his house, et cetera. So he was in that flat field of the pendulum for a long time mm. until it swung over. And then, wow. you know, of course, everybody was, you know, giving it accolades. Wow. But I think it's very common in, in creative people, but also with anybody. I'm sorry, my dog is here with me and she'll be barking occasionally. Right. But she's welcome. <laughs> it's very common, I think, to have those moments of like in complete doubt. You know, mm -hmm. and, and this is something that I kind of had to get into an agreement with my wife about is that I would put away two to three months salary um, in a separate bank account. And almost psychologically, it was there just so that I had the freedom within the context of any kind of company to speak my mind without worrying about whether I was doing it to please my manager or my boss's boss's boss or if I was speaking truly. And if mm -hmm. I, spoke truly and I was fired or let go, then that's one thing. But I didn't want to get into a st state of compromising who I was in order to keep my job, you know, and keep my insurance and, you know, which are important things, especially in the United States. But, but I, I began to realize that so many creative people that I know go into the creative arts, um, you know, whether it's, you know, an agency side or whether it's, you know, working in, inside of a company and the thing that they, brought them great joy and delight starts to seep out of them quickly. Now, part of it is just, you know, the reality of you're not going to make something brilliant every time. But part of it is also the feeling that I'm just compromising and compromising, and compromising down to a point that I don't even know why I'm doing this, you know? And so again, that's the reason why I felt it was important to think about creative courage in that context. Yeah, I think uh, courage is the perfect word, isn't it? And Coppola, I guess, had that like <laughs> a very extended period of courage as he was yeah. kind yeah. of holding on. Um, that's interesting. So moving slightly into kind of a bit more of the binary sense of our formulaic creative teams, I'm yeah. interested in your, your views on 
again, it, it comes up, we've, we've spoken previously and we've met, and it comes up as well in the book about job titles and kind of trying to right. formalize hierarchies. And what do you think that does for, say, young creatives? Um, mm -hmm. Is it is it all about validation? Are they just seeking something rather than are they focusing too much on that rather than that freedom, that creativity? Well, you know, I, I find it funny that the people who have always told me that titles don't matter are the people who have really fancy titles. You know, like it's almost like the CEO or the SVP who says, ah, titles don't matter. You know, like just do good work. And I tell them, no, titles matter quite a bit. And yeah. um, um, it's psychological, if nothing else. And sometimes people would rather have a title than a pay raise. Um, mm -hmm. And what I found when I was building teams is number one, by the time that a designer, you know, or a UX researcher or whoever was, you know, interviewing with me, I, I assumed that they had already passed all the requirements for craft and, and the capability. And what I was looking for was culture at that point. Mm -hmm. And so and one of the things that I was I would tell them is like, you know, I'm hiring you for this particular job description, but in reality, I'm hiring you because you can do much more than that. And I think that so many times people are hired into uh, companies and kind of constrained to a box and said, like, this is what we hired you for, but this is all you're going to do. In reality, you can that person can do so much more, but they're never given that opportunity mm -hmm. to because from a mechanistic perspective, if you are managing a group of people, you you, if you're not thinking really holistically, you're thinking, I just need them to do this one thing. Whereas I always thought, no, they, they should be able to expand and learn and do many more things. And so the job description was kind of bait in order to get them into the room where I could find out what else they could do. And then I get three X that person. But to your point about titles, then what would happen is that because a lot of designers that I was on my team were in their mid twenties and they, they had this kind of university mentality that, well, I did my my hours and my my work. Shouldn't I get promoted, you know, year to year? And and in reality, there's there's only so much room at the top, so to speak, and you can't really keep promoting people continuously. But what you can do and I would tell them is that I said, I, I can't give you a new title necessarily. But what I can do is compensate you. You know, I can give you uh, more opportunities for, for bigger projects you can lead to learn more you know, be creatively, uh, have more agency of your creative work. And then I can actually literally pay you more money, you know, for doing good work. And yeah. and if that doesn't work, I would often say, I will help you find a job somewhere else. That, and, and this is not being mean at all. It's actually the opposite. I will actually uh, give you a reference and help you find that job in another company if you like. And by having that kind of openness and being completely, in my case, non-hierarchical about the process, it, it led to an environment which you know, it wasn't perfect, but it certainly wasn't fear-based. So. It's interesting. What, what do you think drives creatives to like, seek out the job title, though? Is it is it validation? Yeah. Is it is it there's a vulnerability? Uh, well, everybody, I think basic human psychology is everybody wants to be seen, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. um, a very effective technique. And it's not just I wasn't using it simply to manipulate, but if you literally know someone's name, and you call out their name in a group setting just to acknowledge the work that they've done, it's incredibly powerful. So the title, I think, is tied into the fact that they want to be acknowledged, that he or she or they want to be acknowledged for the work that they've done, you know, like, and, and to be seen for that. And, and it's amazing if you do that, how much more um, happy the team becomes very quickly. Um, and it comes down to the fact that to be seen as something that's very important within any group dynamic to where I would have one-on-ones every every week, mm -hmm. one-on-fives with my team members, you know, who normally don't talk to each other. Because even within design groups, as you probably know, when you're working on a project, you tend to get tribal and you're stuck in that group. And so right. what I would do is I would cross-pollinate different designers and even bring product managers into a meeting. So we would have coffee and, and donuts, you know, and I was eating way too many donuts. And then I would do one-on-ones and I would go all the way down to the intern um, mm -hmm. to understand who they are, you know, because if you understand, you know, I, I wasn't trying to like find out deep, dark secrets, but if I know that someone's going through a difficult process or a time in their life for their health or their family, it gives me context so I can adjust the workload accordingly. Right. You talk about the tribes and tribalism and things, and do yep. you think that breed, can breed, in a negative sense, competitiveness? Right. Um, 
we're, we're all trying to we're all trying to embrace innovation and creativity to shift the world shift the needle better and this competitiveness is suddenly orbiting around these industries is kind of at odds to that yeah well i think it's there's tribalism is both good and bad right i mean on one level it's good because you're proud of your company you're proud of the brand you're yeah. proud of the work that you do you're proud of being a uh, in this case, a designer, you know, like it, it, it the title is important. It, yeah. The only time it becomes a problem is when it's exclusionary and, and then it becomes um, tribal in the sense that I've seen this in factions where like, you know, the project would have done great if it wasn't for product or if it wasn't for marketing or if it wasn't for <laughs> technology. It's always, you know, and it's easy to okay. easy to demonize another group and it's an easy way out. The, the more difficult thing is to see where a difficult process, pro problem area is and then embrace it and go in and actually literally have um, reach out to those per those people that you're having difficulty with. So one of the last projects that I worked on when I was at Hulu was this one Hulu project where we literally launched it with um, members from marketing, brand, product, tech and design, product design together mm -hmm. so that it was a con continuous kind of expression of communication and visual you know, branding all the way from the billboard you would see on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles all the way through wow. to the product itself, you know, including all the commercial advertisements in between. And and you in, in by doing this, you end up with this holistic kind of experience, which not many companies do terribly well. So yeah. I think that's important to reach across the aisle constantly when you are tribal. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it takes a big culture shift, I guess. Um, mm. Just sort of, sort of moving on slightly, there's a phrase of yours that I, I really, really like um, at the start of some creativity, and it's yeah. be as messy as possible or something right. around that kind of terminology. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, yeah, I, uh, that sings to my heart, so to speak. Yeah. How do you feel in teams, their in-house teams, agency style teams that when creativity has to be transactional so um, mm -hmm. you're commercially buying a creative service right how do you feel that messiness can be sold because to a non-creative that just feels nervy or chaotic right. yeah well we had this problem again i have to keep referencing my last job but you know essentially we when we first started we had the team we were hiring in-house you know, so I had to hire a lot of people for that in internally. But I also worked with two external agencies. One was called Huge, which was based primarily in Brooklyn, but had an LA office. The other one was IDO out of San Francisco. Yeah. And <clears throat> one of the things that we did with Huge is um, literally, I said, this is one team, both the internal Hulu team and the Huge team. And we had um, embedded teams both on both buildings. So I would have my design team at Hulu literally be at the other agency's office in their office for two days a week and vice versa. They would then come over and spend two days a week. And it wasn't perfect, but what it did is it broke down those boundaries. Mm. And so the messiness of the creative process would happen in two war rooms in parallel, one that would be at the Hulu office and one over at the agency office. And they didn't necessarily reflect each other because they were happening in real time Right. And, and the majority of it, you know, was built out of post-it notes initially because I was very much interested in like not going into, you know, at the time sketch, now Figma. I didn't want to go into digital representation too quickly. Right. I wanted to break out the problem. And so we actually started at a very high level and said, you know, instead of talking about, you know, what's the competition doing, let's talk about the patron saint of this project. So at the time, David Bowie had died about a week after I had started. Okay. And I thought it would be really interesting to have him as a patron saint. So I codenamed the UX Bowie because it would be constantly ch -ch -ch changing over time according right. to user behavior and technology. And then the other inspiration was a, uh, an artist named James Terrell, who has this amazing artist of light. And the idea was to kind of have James Terrell as the, the Zen kind of you know, environment, and then you would have on the other side, uh, the rock and roll ethos of change of Bowie. And then the two of these would be symbolic of the project so that we had the mindset going into it. And again, Bowie was extremely, you know, chaotic and messy, but organized in how he did his work and most artists are. Design, of course, is utility, 
but I wanted to have that spirit embedded into the project itself as we did it. Right, nice. That's very, uh, yeah, the, the metaphors are, are lovely. Mm -hmm. um, bearing in mind that messiness, I guess, and, and practicing it, I, I yeah. guess, um, in and out of the workplace, Right. Um, I know you personally like to explore your own capabilities away from work. Yeah. Um, and I guess you would advocate that of, of anyone right. um, creatively. Um, how do you think it has to be tactile and hands on? Do you think it has to be painting or ceramics or no. can it well, I, push yourself whatever's <clears throat> needed for that individual? When I, I, one of the things well, what you're referencing is what I would do is tell my design team to do something that's not design outside of the office. Mm -hmm. um, I would encourage them. I couldn't tell them to do anything, but I would say, you know, try something that you haven't done before. And it could be anything from ceramics, which is very chaotic in a sense, you know, because you're controlling very, you know, earth, you know, essentially and spinning it around. And, and then the other thing would be like, um, you know, there is a technical program manager who I was you know, mentoring to some extent. And she was an immigrant <clears throat> from uh, Hong Kong. English is a second language, and she started to do stand-up comedy, where she had been doing it, and she'd been hiding it from her day job because she didn't want to be taken less seriously. Well, now she's doing it full time, and so she actually transitioned from that into that. I'm not saying that that's what you want, but I'm saying like it's very healthy, I think, to separate your creative process from the thing you do in front of a computer all the time. So right. what what I did as an example post. Uh, leaving my day job, well, n during my day job, I, I did a whole painting series, uh, analog painting series, you know, like paint on canvas, but I also wrote two books by getting up earlier in the morning. And, and then post my day job, I took a class, a, a theater course in Shakespeare and had to get on stage and actually recite Iago's soliloquy from Othello, which was terrifying. But I did it because it was uncomfortable. You know, and it, sorry, there's a plane or a helicopter coming over right now. One second. Very low. Um, and then the other thing that I, I did was take up stand up paddle boarding because mm -hmm. there's something uh, immensely beautiful about being out in the ocean. Uh, again, this is in Los Angeles. And, and being, you know, I think I mentioned to you what was the creative courage tie in was being out on the ocean on the surface. And, and then suddenly the fog came in and I couldn't see the shore. And there was something exhilarating and terrifying to be on top of this massive body of water where who knows what is below you and you don't know which way to go. Um, and then it became a metaphor in my mind of literally how we are on this clot of dirt called Earth hurtling through an infinite amount of space. And we don't yeah. think about that at times because it's just too terrifying, but in reality, the fact that you get up every day and do just get out of bed, it requires a certain amount of courage. And right. I, doing these practices creatively beyond your day job help strengthen that muscle of creativity and courage. Uh, can you feel in those moments in, invigorated that doing the Shakespeare short course, do you, can you see that translate straight into your work and you feel oh, that you've reset? Right. Okay. Yeah, because I think what happens is that in any business, you, you get good at what you do which is an important thing, but then you tend to do the same things a lot mm -hmm. you know, to where it becomes a default, you know, way that you set up everything you do digitally or you, whatever you're doing in life. And so, you know, it's the same thing. Like when I drove, when I was going to an office, instead of like driving the same route every single day, I would try to find different ways to drive to work or back <clears throat> that would purposely get me lost just for the moment, you know, just so I could, see what it was like to feel a little bit uncomfortable. And going back to the David Bowie you know, reference, one of, the, one of the many brilliant quotes that he had was, it's important to, when you're on, this, on the you know, beach, to walk out to the shore and then walk out into the water and get just to the point to where your toes don't quite touch the ground. And that's where you wanna be yeah. in life, creatively, always. Yeah. Keep, so. moving, keep moving, sure. Yeah. Um, very nice, well the paddle boarding, um, yeah, it's an inspiration to us all actually where KD is based. We do a lot of paddleboarding, so maybe I'll have to take that up. Even yeah, it's surfing. Yeah. yeah. Um, right, we got a bit of time left, John. Um, John, mm -hmm. so I've got some questions. I think this is going to sure. be very interesting for you, having read the book, which I'll mention again. Does culture change always need top management buy-in? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I've tried it the other way where I did a grassroots approach to changing you need a, 
um, sponsor. You need to have someone at a C-level, uh, ideally the CEO of the company, who actually says, yes, I want you to do this. Because if you don't, not only will you be doing something that might be considered a distraction to the business, uh, you'll also get no financial support or any kind of you know resources. And so I think what I've done in the past is, you know, on my own, I, I built a presentation about a, um, a change in culture, a change in design processes on my own, and then made a presentation to the C-level and said, this is, I think, what we need for the company. And then that, they bought into it. But then if they don't buy into it, then it's very difficult to do anything, you know? Right. Uh, can I make you expand on that a little bit? Because I know we've just got a few minutes. Um, yeah. You refer to um, uh, working in a des design function in a business, and I'll let you reveal if that business if you so wish, where the CEO had started to buy into creativity and design thinking because yep. of private conversations they were having with thought leaders. Mm -hmm. But it still didn't work because of the middle wedge beneath you and the CEO. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't think. Well, maybe I shouldn't say the company, but it's a well-known giant e-commerce company. Um, sure, let's we can leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the the CEO actually um, got religion, so to speak, about design and realized that the company mm -hmm. had been a very long history of being a tech company, but needed to really evolve into the future. And so he said, "Let's do it." He allowed me to have agency to actually build a, a movement within the company with a few other leaders. But the problem is that then we tried to, we had the groundswell of, you know, buy-in from the people who really wanted to do it. We had the very top person interested in doing it, but the middle level of VPs uh, were intransigent. And one of the things that we tried to do to break through that was a, like a Stanford D school IDEO design thinking workshop Mm -hmm. which I think worked within that day, you know, from because it went from being very dubious in the beginning of the day, you know, to finally end of day going, yeah, this makes sense. Let's do this. And then, of course, the next day defaulting right back into the same behavior that they had always had. So that, that was an example where it didn't work well. So I think ideally, if you're doing a startup, it has to be inculcated into the into the DNA of the business from the beginning. You know, it's it's you the the cliche, you know, examples would be, you know, like Apple with design being very much part of it, Airbnb, um, but not all companies have that. So the, the difficult thing is when a company is mature, how do you transition them from the way they are into where they should be, um, you know, from a user experience and customer experience perspective? And that's yeah. a challenge. It's difficult. Is that then, would you say that you could offer advice to say someone that started their creative career to think carefully about the organizations yes, and do that due diligence. Right. I, I, even I do that. I, I'm consulting with many companies right now. And I, mm -hmm. you know, look, the good thing about consulting is I can see many different companies. And what's interesting is the commonality of problems, even though what they're selling is very different. It's all about management and humanity to a large extent. But if you're a beginning designer, uh, I wrote about this in the book, you know, and I gave a speech to these Princeton design students. And I said, you're going to come out of your training with this much ability, like a huge amount of capability, but you're going to go probably work for an Apple or a Google or a Facebook or, you know, you know, Netflix or whoever. And they're going to hire you because you can do this, but they're going to give you a job responsibility that's about this big. And you're going to say, I can do this. I can do this. And I say, yes, we know, but you're going to do this. And the question you have, and I, I often tell them, is you should do that, by the way. You should go work for a large company for a few years at least, and then decide if you want to do a work within the company like that and work your way through it, or do you want to leave and do a startup? Or do you want to be a consultant? You know, but it, it, you'll find out what your temperament is and your, your stomach for that kind of work very quickly. And some people I know, thrive and they're brilliant creative people within the construct of a, of a large company but use it because there's a culture around that design group that allows insulates them from you know a lot of the politics of the overall company but then there's some people who simply can't do that and they have to be a freelance you know hired gun to come in and affect change and yeah. uh, i'm probably a hybrid between those two yeah got you oh john we're out of time i think yeah. um I could, I've said it before at the start, I could talk for hours. I'm sure many of our audience would, would want to ring you up and talk for hours as well. Um, thank you 
for joining us and finding time out in the US. Um, oh, yeah. And p paddleboarding saves your soul, it turns out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Take care. Speak to you.